we have gifts of the Holy Spirit that are there to inspire us to believe that our spirit has abilities beyond the normal that we've been taught through science and being brought up the taste the smell the touch the hearing the sight you know um, the holy spirit gifting us a image or a picture or thoughts or words in our mind gives us the inspiration to believe i have the ability to be able to perceive something beyond the physical realm i wanted to ask you about the the sensation of vibration um I often feel it at night and also when I am just um, waiting on the Lord, I feel it. Um, there has been one instance where I was, I think, translated somewhere. It it seemed like maybe another dimension, but my, my legs were vibrating from the calves down. And that was, I've never experienced that one before. And I actually thought maybe my phone is at the end of my bed vibration. And I, I turned out of the vision and, and went and checked and it, nothing there. And then I went back to it, back into where I was and it just continued. And I'm just curious, I I really don't understand what this is. Maybe you can help me. Yeah, I mean, vibration um, and frequency are slightly two different things. So when something vibrates, the frequency is how often it vibrates in a period of time. So in terms of vibration, your, your physical body is reacting to a spiritual phenomena. So that might be the presence of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and people begin to shake or they begin to vibrate or they might even feel hot. When something vibrates or you rub it against it, something else, friction causes heat. So if the presence of the Spirit begins to cause your body to react it sometimes can feel like it's getting hot or it can feel like there's a physical sensation that your body is reacting to something spiritual um, and it can simply be that it, it almost like this is a real phenomenon whether you're going in the spirit trans translating or whether you're having a, a spiritual experience in terms of a vision or an encounter your physical body is part of that it may not be physically going into another realm but your consciousness is going into another realm you're still connected to your body um, and therefore your body may react and and that's perfectly normal um, some people may, bodies may be more sensitive than other people's bodies um, so it may well be that you happen to be quite sensitive in the body to physical, f spiritual phenomena, you know. Um, now, when you are engaging in a dynamic like that, um, I wouldn't be tr too concerned with trying to figure it out, you know, because that could cause a distraction. Oh, why am I vibrating? What's going on? You know, just go with it. It's nothing bad. It's just it's just a natural phenomena of the body reacting to spiritual things. Um, and you have all sorts of things like that, like people get slain in the spirit, as people used to call it. You know, something physically touches their body in that they can't stand under the weight of God's presence. And their body sort of crumples because it just can't stand in that. And literally, um, physical phenomena like that happen. People shake. And some people will shake quite violently. Um, and that could be an, a sign of something going on in, in the sense of a wrestling. You know, sometimes there is a spiritual dynamic where people, God is setting someone free and there's a resistance to that freedom and people can shake as a result of that. But sometimes people just shake gently when they're resting in God's presence and they just have that sort of sensation. Frequency is slightly different in the frequency is let's say a spiritual being let's say you engage an angel and the angel has a vibrational frequency of its light form that makes it visible to us to our natural eyes hence the frequency of the vibration of that 
being is coming down into the range that we can perceive it could be vibrating at a much higher frequency than our eyes have the ability to perceive and we wouldn't be able to see it but our spirit and our soul has the ability to perceive frequency at a much higher rate than our eyes now we have um, frequencies of sound and we have frequencies of light and effective, they're all electromagnetic energy frequencies, but our eye tunes into different frequencies than our ear does. And the eye has a very limited spectrum that we call the visible spectrum, which we call the seven colors of the rainbow, if you like. Um, and so it's a visible spectrum, has particular wavelengths. Once you go either other end of those wavelengths, and you get to infrared or ultraviolet, you can't see them with the natural eye. But they still exist as vibrating energy. You just can't perceive them with the eye. But you can um, have audible frequencies, which are much higher, which you can perceive. And of course, animals like a dog can perceive an audible frequency way higher than our ears can detect. detect. But also you can detect those frequencies as thoughts in your mind. So God can be speaking to you. It is a frequency which is not audible to the natural ears, but the brain can translate that vibrational energy and interpret it as a thought. So thoughts have frequencies. In fact, everything is vibrating at a frequency, no matter what it is. Because everything really is energy, um, which has a particular frequency. Some can be felt, heard, seen, and others can't be seen naturally or felt naturally, but they can be spiritually. So our spiritual eyes, are, the eyes of our heart, has the capacity of being able to engage frequencies that are higher or unable to be detected by our physical senses. But we can still see them, perceive them, experience them, whether God is speaking to us, thoughts in our mind, visions in our mind. Our imagination, the eyes of our heart, has the capacity to produce images that are operating. Uh, we have dreams in that realm. You can't see dreams with your natural eye, but when you're asleep, your actual soul can en engage, your imagination can actually experience dreams so they're all vibrational frequency a patterns of energy that we learn to discern now we can train our senses to discern energy frequency vibrations um, if we focus and learn to practice training our senses to discern some of that discernment may be intuition where you sense something but you're still actually sensing something which is real. You know, when you walk into the room and you may feel an energy in the room, which could be, let's say, you know, people say, well, you can cut the atmosphere of the room with a knife. Well, literally, they are picking up some sort of energy, usually negative energy in a room. And sometimes people walk in a room and they feel excitement. So the excitement of it is they're picking up and are sensitive to it, which is a frequency. It's an energy. Now, people give off frequencies with their body. And you can train your senses to be able to pick up the frequency of someone's body. Hence, if you were to pray for someone who is sick, the frequency that they're giving off may be a lower frequency that you can detect. And then you can pass a higher frequency into their body by laying hands on them, which raises their lower frequency back into health. That's how we can administrate healing in, 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 in that way. And some people have practiced training their senses so they can see the frequency that people give off. Often a color or a fragrance, because a fragrance is also a frequency. Mm -hmm. um, which we can learn to smell that it's a it's a way which we smell that frequency and our brain interprets the smell as a particular thing which we identify or we may never have smelt that before and we don't know what it is 
you know so literally we can train our senses both physically spiritually emotionally to be able to pick up vibrational energy and determine what it is you know to distinguish between different forms of energy people who do train their senses or or have abilities some people just seem to have natural abilities in that area and other people don't but you can all train your senses to be able to people see colors around people and those different colors reflect the, the person's energy and usually the brighter colors are higher frequencies and the lower sort of frequencies are darker colors and you can sort of pick that up and so some people might be seemingly quite dark in the energy they're giving off um so it's all practice you know you practice training you practice but sort of in what you're experiencing i would just go with it you know don't try and sort of try and figure it out just say okay my body's reacting that's good that's okay i'm gonna go with that um but also think about you know how do i train my all my senses to be able to perceive different frequencies that are operating in different ways so that i can be um, discerning of what is going on around me maybe what god is saying to me what god is communicating to me what i'm beginning to perceive when i started to practice i didn't know what i was doing you know i, I sort of had no idea what i was doing but i'd begun to pick things up spiritually um, i'd had encounters where i was went into heaven and things like that which were let's say trance-like experiences where my body seemed to be suspended um from its sort of surroundings and i was completely aware of where i was in that spiritual perspective um and i learned to sort of have more and more of those but then it was like okay how do i perceive when i'm in this realm what is spiritually going on around me in the room you know um, and those in those days we were having meetings and different things there was god was sort of moving in those meetings what was happening what could i see so i i tried to to practice so i thought okay i can see with my physical eyes can i use my spiritual senses to still see in a way that related to the physical and the spiritual in the same realm and and i just sort of tried to sort of practice doing that and you know it wasn't immediate that i could do it so there were two ways i would do it one is i would stand quietly at the back of the room and i would look at the room and see the physical room then i would close my eyes and i would look to activate my imagination to continue perceiving the physical room now you can do that by memory obviously well you know what's in the room but maybe things are changing in the room so i would just begin to picture the room using my imagination with my eyes closed now to start with i close my eyes black couldn't see anything but then i focus my intention on the room okay so i'm then looking to tune into that room in a different way than my natural eyes tune into it but i've got the reference point of my natural eyes to give me a starting point so i started doing that and it sort of like was all hazy and fuzzy to start with but i just kept going and focusing and focusing so then when my eyes were closed i had the impression of the room and that was a visual impression or a sensory perception let's say and then I began to tune into the spiritual frequencies that were going on in the room. And then I could see angels and I could see people giving off different colors. And I became sort of more tuned to the spiritual dynamic of the room, um, which was great. And it was like, wow. And then it was like, this is too much information so i'm receiving too much information then so then i would open my eyes and well could i still perceive and i could so i was seeing the physical 
And then I was seeing with the eyes of my heart superimposed. So I could see the room, but I also had the perception of the spiritual dynamic that was going on in the room. So that was all practice, you know, and I tried various things during that time. You know, there's my hand, hand, I'm looking at my hat and closing my eyes. Can I still see my hand? You know, I just use various techniques to see if I could tune my senses in that way. Um, and, you know, eventually I could do it. And then at one point I was doing and I didn't sort of like, how do I stop doing this? You know, so it was like it was too much information that was overload and quite distracting to everyday life to be like that. So I sort of asked God, well, how do I turn this off? And he said, well, by intention, it's your choice. You can see and you can choose not to see. So, I'll, oh, OK. OK, so I'll choose not to see. And then when I go into a room and I want to see, you know, particularly if you're in a room, there's a dynamic of things happening. God's doing something. Or you want to tune into what he's doing. You know, then I'm going to activate those senses to do it. And literally, I, I sort of ask, well, how do I explain what I'm doing? And he said, well, you're engaging the room with your spirit a little bit like sonar or radar. In with sonar, you send a ping of sound into the room. And then that sound repeats, bounces back off an object as an echo. And you have a screen that picks up the, the echo, if you like, of that bounce back. Um, and so that's how I sort of perceive what I was doing. I was engaging the room with my spirit. Then I was receiving back what the spirit was sort of feeding back to me, like radar or sonar. And so I became tuned. Now, a radar operator or a sonar operator isn't actually seeing the actual object. They're seeing the reaction to what they've engaged the object with. So I was perceiving what my spirit was engaging the object with in the room and i sort of practiced until that became something i could do whenever i wanted to or whenever i felt i needed to you know it wasn't like i i did it i you know i did it less and less as time went on because i got sort of more in tune in general um and i felt less of a need to do that unless you know unless i really felt the father's heart was there in the practicing stage, God, you know, gave me the permission to do whatever I want to practice. It was like, hey, have a go at this, you know. And then when I could do it, I only needed to do it when the Father's heart was was showing me to do it, really. Um, so that's really what sort of frequency, vibration, you know, they are scientific terms that relate to something that are connected but have different physical and spiritual sort of dynamics to it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's it's helpful. Um, it's a rather new experience to me. I have already been able to see in the spirit, mm -hmm. but this is now something I'm feeling in my body. I'm not shaking, but it is like, you know, if you have one of those back massagers that vibrates, yeah. if someone was to put that on you, you would feel that. That is what it feels like to me, generally my torso or sometimes my legs. So mm -hmm. maybe it's... um. It's, uh, it's very encouraging that I'm experiencing something new and another aspect of the spirit realm. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's no, awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, Robin, you got your hand up there. Hi. Yes. I just, um, just thought came to mind like, on that um, conversation that might, I was just thinking maybe, maybe you could do a series of exercises to help people you know, to kind of grow with this, like you just demonstrated with the hand. Um, I, ha I have done that. I mean, we have a, um, some supernatural workshops that I did back in 2011, 12, which were actual practical workshops, like, okay, close your eyes and, you know, look at your hand or look at the room. And so we did, I have done those exercises um, which were sort of a workshop environment where everyone was looking to practice, you know, and I've done different sorts of things to that in the past. Uh, also using 
crystal bowls and the frequency that they give off and could people pick up the intention carried on the frequency of the sound that a bowl makes um because they all happen to operate at different wavelengths um of sound and so i did workshops around that and actually it was quite interesting that people quite a lot of people were able to pick up the intention that was passed on that uh sound so i would let's say i mean i've got a bowl there um over here so if i made a noise it's just a noise you know and that's okay people could hear the noise but what if when i played that noise or made that noise my intention was that on that wave that people feel and literally if people are close enough to that bowl and you actually cause it to vibrate they can feel that in their body and if you put the bowl on someone's body when you do it they get that vibration penetrating their body but the same wave length of sound is going out into the room and people hear it what if they could that sound wave could carry something on it now this happens scientific things all the time and that's how we send messages uh across wavelengths across airwaves because we <laughs> carry with it in the sound we carry or on the frequency we carry a message it's just we and we're able to encode it and de-encode it but actually when i played the sound with a particular intention people were began to be once they quieting themselves down they were able to pick up the intention so i would say okay i'll play a sound release an intention and say what do you feel what are you sensing what are you picking up so let's say i release the intention of peace and some people said they felt calm or they felt restful or uh, so they they use different words to describe what they were picking up but essentially it was the intention i released they were just interpreting it using words that made sense to them and you know i re released various frequencies to touch people um with that they would receive that and then enter into it so they could enter into the calm the peace the rest that was the intention and that sound became a bath that they could bathe in and that sound could surround them it could penetrate them and bring peace internally i did the same with like healing so i used a particular bowl with uh, a frequency of 528 and i used that that frequency and i released a healing frequency in the sound <laughs> embedded in the sound and i was in a room and i said look okay this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna rather than coming and laying hands on you and pray for you to be healed i'm gonna show you that you can receive healing at a distance from from this intention that i'm releasing through this sound and i'm gonna then show you that that is possible then to use in different circumstances so god can heal you at a distance paul laid hands on pieces of cloth they had an embedded frequency in them and then then they were laid on people people got healed or set free um, mm -hmm. and i did i mean in the room i just said look you have to tune in to receive this you know if you don't receive it it'll just bounce off so open up your heart open up your being to receive this frequency and my intention for healing and there was a guy in the room who was part of our therapy community, community at the time and he was there and he had suffered nerve damage to his body and he was numb down one side of his body um through various things that he'd done um and i released this frequency of healing he received it and his testimony was the whole numbness had gone mm. so yeah this can carry with it and we can practice doing that sort of thing mm -hmm. um so there are there are things out there i think we've got on our website supernatural workshops i think they're called 
um, that I did with various groups of people you know, 10 years ago or 12 years ago um, mm. um, that are still there. Uh, and they are the sort of thing I was trying to help people tune in. So help their spirit tune in. So there were exercises around praying in tongues and praying in tongues while focusing your thoughts on receiving spiritually from God. And that might come as a thought or a picture or it might come as a prophetic word or whatever. But also praying in tongues whilst doing something else was you could do two things at once and learning to become sort of eventually multidimensional. So to start with, the exercise was, well, read the Bible whilst playing in tongues out loud. So your mind can be operating at one level and your spirit can be operating at another level and you can do both at the same time and your spirit can be communicating to your mind whilst you're reading so you can have thoughts about what you're reading come to you from the spirit um and the same thing then applied to the other way around praying tongues in your mind and read out loud so that it was getting people used to doing different things spiritually and not getting distracted whilst they were doing things. And then ultimately, I, I taught people that your spirit can be praying in tongues or communicating all the time to you and to God and be receiving from God all the time and communicating to yourself all the time. You just have to learn to be active by intention and not just sort of be sitting there hoping something would happen or whatever. Focus, you know, so so literally I encourage people to engage their spirit in communication and it felt like a bubbling vibration inside. So I felt like my spirit was bubbling. So it was communicating in a language to god and receiving from god and then i was beginning to sense more in tune with that language and communi be communicated and eventually my spirit would communicate to me through tongues so mm. i would wake up and tongues would be in my mind and i'd be like okay i need to tune to that right now and therefore when i engaged i found my spirit was sharing something that had happened during the night or an experience i'd had or something god wanted me to know so i just learned to become more sensitive to the spirit and sensitive to the language of the spirit whether that be thoughts feelings sensations and knowledge that was infused so that i could become more sensitive to god's heart and feeling and communicating when in that way rather than just in the logical trying to figure out something with my mind you know i could learn to interpret because basically all forms of communication all sensory experiences are a series of electrical impulses you could say that like a computer operates the language of zeros and ones and that language is programmed so that those zeros and ones sort of click off and on gateways, if you like, and open things, then you can then begin to be open to different forms of communication. Like if I take a picture on, on my phone and I send that picture via WhatsApp to somebody, that picture is an image made up of a series of zeros and ones i turn it into zeros and ones if you like in the in the program and then at the other end someone's whatsapp receives that image and they turn it back into an image rather than zeros and ones so that you then they can see it well how did it get to them you know we take all these things for granted now really it just happens doesn't it it's like you send someone a picture on whatsapp they get the picture you know and mm. well how did they get it in some way that was transferred by some form of electrical impulse wi-fi if you like you you are communicating by a 
uh, high fidelity sort of frequency that your router picks up and turns it into an image that gets sent by a protocol sort of is it http or whatever the protocol is that enables you to receive different forms of you know whether it be a web page or anything else yeah you know, we've with sort of technology we've learned to do all this stuff actually that's just a a something that is a technological thing which reflects what we can do spiritually anyway yeah you know, and we can learn to engage and transmit images you know how does god receive my prayers or my thoughts well is it just what well, he just does or actually is he receiving the electrical impulse that i send out the frequency of my intention when i'm communicating with him and his being is able to decode that communication just like my being my conscious brain my consciousness can decode electrical impulses that are sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, but also imagination and other forms of images that may come from visionary experiences and other things. And my spirit is communicating to me. My brain has learned to interpret that and understand it. You know, language needs to be understood and therefore you have to learn the language so if i was to learn chinese which i'm not going to do likely and probably would struggle if i try to um i would have to learn a whole different set of symbols and sounds relating to those symbols that would mean that i could hear something and i could then my brain would interpret that as whatever they're saying you know, I can't, so I could hear Chinese, but I couldn't understand it. And therefore, I need to get the understanding when God speaks, whether it's thoughts or impressions or feelings or anything else, is communication um, that I've learned to decode, if you like. Um, and we can all practice training our senses to do it. Yeah, you know, they're designed to do it. They've just de disconnected from that bandwidth of frequency originally adam could interpret that bandwidth he could engage and see spiritually feel and sense spiritually because he was in tune because his spirit was what was interpreting the world around him rather than his soul so the filter of his spirit gave a perception to the world in which he lived as he chose independence from that his physical senses had to take over in learning to interpret uh, and he lost connection to that um, and over a period of different things different bandwidths of electromagnetic energy we lost connection to the ability to hear and see and perceive at different wavelengths that originally they could and god is restoring our ability to engage those bandwidths with our senses hence we're now beginning to perceive things differently um, in a way which you you have to tune into them and learn how to engage them it's something you you have to practice you know that's the thing train your senses through practice most people want it as a gift in which they're gifted the ability to see you know i wonder whether i think it was elisha's servant who elisha asked that his eyes might be open so he could see what elisha was seeing and he was seeing you know a whole host of heavenly host of fiery chariots and angels and stuff elijah did god just give him the ability or did he learn the ability by engaging with god and being in relationship with god could the servant continue to see after that moment or did he did he have to go and practice to learn how to do that occasionally now we have gifts of the holy spirit that are there to inspire us to believe that our spirit has abilities beyond the normal 
that we've been taught through science and being brought up the taste the smell the touch the hearing the sight you know um, the holy spirit gifting us a image or a picture or thoughts or words in our mind gives us the inspiration to believe i have the ability to be able to perceive something beyond the physical realm but do we practice that until we were doing it or were we still relying on the holy spirit giving us those things because if we are then we're still operating as children when we need to mature and become adults in that our spirit can perceive exactly the same things that the spirit might communicate to us as a picture or an image or anything like that um, but it does require practice training our senses to learn how to do it and most people aren't probably willing to put in the effort to do it and to practice you know to train yourself to be really good at anything takes a lot of practice you know you know yeah you know, when you look at someone i don't know playing tennis on the tv you know and wimbledon or us open or something and you watch them and they think well they make it look really easy you know they just just run and hit the ball and know seemingly what sort of shots to play but they've trained and trained and trained for years to get to that level of ability to be able to play tennis and there are a lot of people in the world who play tennis for a sort of hobby or pastime or exercise that cannot compete with those people because they just have not put the practice in they're not physically fit like they are they've not trained hitting repetitive shots over and over and over and literally you know you can get a ball machine that fires different balls at different spin things to you and people can practice hitting 100 balls at a time with the forehand and the backhand and then volleying at the net and all sorts of things and those people who want to get better at tennis will do that you know um those people who just want to enjoy the odd game won't they'll just play the odd game you know and some people might be quite naturally gifted hand-eye coordination being able to hit a ball with a racket um and they might be able to go on court and you know actually hit the ball quite well but they probably won't beat someone who's probably got lesser skills or lesser natural ability but has practice and has perfected being able to play tennis but if those people who've got natural skills also put in the practice then you've got people who are really really gifted at tennis um now some people may like children may have some sort of natural ability but they have been encouraged like tiger woods was picking up a golf club a cut down golf club when he was like two or something you know and so like the williams twins or sisters sorry they were playing tennis and their father was coaching them at tennis when they were very very young to which they were encouraged to pursue that as a career um, and other people just enjoy the odd game or might learn to play at school and never go beyond that you know and that's fine because they don't really want to and that's perfectly adequate perfectly fine for them you know i was sort of in between in that i'm naturally skillful hand-eye coordination with rackets you know i can pick up any racket and generally just play a game and i practiced enough to get me to a certain level but i didn't have a tennis club where i lived you know i just had local courts i didn't table tennis i did have a club and i got quite good at table tennis ping pong in the u.s um and got at a level that i was sort of county sort of level but then to go further than that to become national level i would have had to really put in a lot more effort and i wasn't willing to do it because i had a lot of other things in life that i was doing you know that i enjoyed and whatever and so i was never really motivated to go any further i you know i you know, look back and think well how far could i have got if i had put in the effort I don't know but it doesn't really matter because i didn't you know so i just accept hey you know i can still pick up a racket and generally play with anybody at a level 
that I can get the ball back. If I was to play with someone who was a professional tennis player and they decided they were going to play their A game, I would hardly get anything back, I doubt, you know, because um, I just wouldn't be unless they hit it straight at me. You know, so, you know, all of this is a is a, a mixture of what we have the ability to do, but what we need to practice to do so that we're more skilled at it and that it becomes natural to us and becomes our state of being. You know, when you are a top professional athlete, um, you have that as who you are. It becomes, you know, you can just go out and you can play at a level that no one else could because you've got yourself to that level. Now it's part of who you are. You know, most people aren't at that level, but you can be in the spiritual dynamic. We're all sons of God and we're all created to have the ability to communicate with God and operate in sonship. Therefore, I think we can train our senses to go beyond the gift or the inspiration to it becoming, well, this is who I am. You know, I have this ability to be able to experience God, engage heavenly things, see spiritual dynamics and experience those things. You know, and I think God has designed it to enable us to do it. But we have to learn how to do it because we weren't born with those things naturally operating our spirit was created in that way but we're having to be reintegrated spirit soul and body uh, to be able to function as god intended because our mind gets in the way mostly we don't believe we can we've been told you can't we've been told people who see things are weird you know <laughs> so that we are put off being weird because society treats those people as being weird when they talk about seeing things in the room and that wouldn't go down too well in certain professions or jobs you know if you're operating as a scientist and you tell people that you can see weird stuff you know probably it's not going to help your career path so people tend to focus you know on on certain areas and don't really go to as far as they could okay i do have a question <laughs> and it has to do with the living letters of the hebrew aleph bet yeah and uh, i know just and other others have spoken about how the hebrew letters how they're you know beings of light and how they're involved in creation and you know because god you know he spoke the word and the word is made up of letters mm -hmm. which made all beings and all things on earth and in the heavenly dimensions so i'm wondering what you know, this is hard to frame as a question but what what does the interface or interaction between humans and the living letters look like exactly is it you know is it, it kind of similar to the interaction between human beings and angels or human beings and saints okay. or human beings and other heavenly beings and the reason i ask this um you know is is you know is because i'm thinking of the human I, i'm sorry i'm thinking about the living letters is these beings of light that are almost like abstract symbols you know i can almost picture them you know as living letters um and i just want to see what your response is mike because i had this encounter a long while ago and i'll explain what that is but let me just get what yeah, you have to um, say about that first i th i think there's a um there's an issue between mixing the fact that there may well be living letters living light beings that are part of creation creating everything and form the fabric of everything and hebrew culture therefore it's not about learning hebrew it just happens that these living letters seem to be part of an alphabet but in mm -hmm. reality, it's nothing to do with Hebrew culture or you have to be a Hebrew or understand the he the letters. Because when you speak with the voice of God creatively, 
that light responds to your voice in the same way, whether you understand hin Hindu language or any other language, it's not the language which is important. It's the intention that you speak and the authority you speak with. So I don't speak Hebrew. And when I speak creatively to call something into being, I don't think of living letters or Hebrew letters and have to turn it into Hebrew letters for light to respond to me, to form reality around me. Mm. So <laughs> understanding that there may well be a way that how God spoke things into being and what was God's voice and it was the the light that responded to his voice mm. produced something see jesus is the word that was with god in the beginning now jesus is you know you well and people get really hung up on all this well jay didn't exist in the language before you know the 15th century or whatever mm. therefore it's yeshua <laughs> you know, say the word yeshua and whatever it's like why? Why get caught up in all that nonsense? It's nothing to do with the reality that Jesus was God's intention in a living way that produced creation. It doesn't really matter whether there were living letters that sort of responded to it or not, to be honest. Because if you try and think, oh, I've got to speak and a living letter is going to respond, you just put a, another layer of complexity into what is quite simple i call things that be not as if they are and light responds to the authority when i speak god's word when i speak his intention in his heart and reality forms if i would got to say well which which hebrew letter which i'm gonna have to learn hebrew to be able to create anything where well, this is just the fact that god's words are living they are alive and the living light, which is the fabric of everything that is formed in a creational way, responds to God's intentions as words. But God could speak words in English or Japanese or Chinese or any other language. It doesn't really matter what the words are. It's the intention that form those words. So when I brood with God and I resonate with his heart and I become a frequency that can speak his intention, then light responds to my voice like it responds to his voice. But I'm not speaking Hebrew and I'm not even thinking about living letters in the slightest. And I think it adds another layer to people and actually stops people act, acting very simply in terms of creatively when they think, They've got to understand what the Hebrew letters are in words to be able to form those ideas into a reality. And I think it's mixed up with Hebrew roots and Hebrew culture and a, and a whole mess of stuff which confuses the issue. You know, God is not Hebrew. So God's ideas and words existed before anything else. Now, it might be, but the Hebrew language was communicated to them because god chose them to be able to communicate to the world as the light of the world which they failed to do and now we are operating in that role as sons of god and therefore we can communicate as light to the world and be a lamp and a light to help people find their way to god but i don't think you have to think about it in any terms of a, a culture of the old testament or the culture of the hebrew people it's just that is how god chose to give them a language and it might have reflected those living letters but you don't need to understand the living letters to be creative because light responds to me speaking in english because my english is just my thoughts mm -hmm. you know that helps me understand what i'm communicating and my desire out of god's desire that's interesting. You you kind of say that that way because, you know, I just I kind of share what I experienced. You know, I've always kind of shied away from the Hebrew letters. You know, it just always seems so complicated. Although, 
Yeah, I can see for some people it's intriguing because they're so pictorial yeah. and symbolic and, you know, people who track on symbolism would be really drawn into that. But that said, I, you know, this was years ago. I had this incredibly vivid dream where I, it was almost like you're watching, you know, the handwriting on the wall, if you can kind of picture that, yeah. the finger yeah. of God writing something on a wall. Only the finger wasn't there, but I saw this script. It was a cursive script written using the English alphabet, mm. right? And it was essentially the word Sarah, capital S-A-R-A-T-T. -T. Mm. Mm. And I mean, the, the light on these letters was, you know, there aren't words for describing it. It was like living light. And I saw the words, each one, each letter formed as, you know, the hand is moving from left to right, although only, only there was no hand. Mm. And immediately I thought, Sarah, and that God was giving me a spiritual name. You are a Sarah. Mm. And I snapped out of it and I thought, two T's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are those two T's? And then I thought, oh, let me check the Hebrew lexicon. So I ran to the Hebrew lexicon and I looked up the name Sarah. And I forget which passage that was one of the, you know, first mentions of her. Mm -hmm. And I saw the two little, I don't know the Hebrew word for it, but there were two little T's. And what my recollection was is the two little T's somehow you know, as I thought about it later, I kept thinking they were above the word, but actually they're below the word. But there are these two little T's, which I think are markings for the vowel sounds, you mm -hmm. know, in the Hebrew lat uh, language. So when I saw this in the lexicon, I thought, bingo, that corroborates the visionary thing that I had experienced. Yeah. But in any event, you know, you hear a lot of discussion right now about the Hebrew letters and all of that. But, you know, God does, I really believe he's speaking all languages, you know, yeah. and his, but he, but his messages are. What you saw written was not Hebrew. No, no. And you it was, English, you know. And you saw it from right to left and not left to right. So yes, you saw exactly. it in a way that you could communicate and understand and connect with. And I think that's the, that's the key. That's it. If you get exactly. caught up on it. what the form is then you can get drawn into something which just makes it complicated and confusing. And for most people, they don't have the ability or the time or the inclination to learn Hebrew. Well, I didn't need to learn Hebrew to create something or to speak that way because I am communicating God's desire and heart in thoughts, which are words that are released. Now, I can speak them out physically if I want to or just release them as thoughts and intentions of the heart. Uh, and they're equally as effective. So have I ever seen a living letter coming out of my mouth when I spoke? No. Did I need to? No. And did I see a living being taking my words and engaging light with those words for light to form? No, I never saw that. I've never seen that. Are those words living? Yeah, they contain the intention and power of, of God within them. Are they beings? Well, maybe those beings are just designed to represent God in this way. But I've never engaged a being of, of living letter being, you know, and never really felt drawn to or needed to in a way that okay these beings what are they they're living beings that represent the different letters of the alphabet so do these beings have to come together and hold hands to form a word i don't think so 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 what what is it then what is the intention of a living well what is the intention of an angelic being what is the intention of a guardian or a seraph or they have different functions and god has a purpose for them what that purpose is i don't know you know i know i know what cash melim do some of i know what seraphim do i know what cherubim do i know some of what the 
created beings do to the level that I need to know it. I'm sure they do a whole load of other stuff that I've got no knowledge of and don't need to. So, But I do know that they are created for a purpose and they do have a function within God's overall things. Um, I just feel we just need to don't make another mediation that has to be between us and God to understand God's heart and things. Because that hopefully won't happen but people do get drawn to well i need to understand hebrew then to understand what these living letters are these living letters if they're communicating something from the heart of god are not going to communicate to me in hebrew because i won't understand them what will be the point if they communicated me in french i wouldn't understand them so they communicate to me in english which is the concept that i can understand from something which is living it's alive let's say god's thoughts and intentions are alive and may be represented by beings that are part of that process or maybe they're not part of the process i don't know and i don't think i need to know because when i did was called to create something i just put my intention to it and there it was you know it wasn't any more complicated than that I certainly didn't think, oh, what Hebrew letters need to form this concept for this being to form. I didn't need to do that. I just instinctively released the intention that God showed me for the formation of that. Now, you know, I'm, if, if people are experiencing these beings in heaven or are they seeking them out? Are, are they putting more emphasis on the beings and they are with God? I don't know. I, I think there's always a danger in any engaging any being or any angelic thing that they can become some sort of in you know, emissary or in between us and God. And I don't need a living letter to communicate what God's heart is to me. Because his heart is a living, you know, his communication is living. You know. So, you know, I probably can't really answer you per se, but I think if God gave you that experience in English, then he's quite capable of that was living to you mm -hmm. and there are also symbols that god uses to mm -hmm. sort of communicate something whether it be a pictorial symbol or a sensory symbol you know there are lots of symbols that mm -hmm. you know sometimes have meaning and sometimes you just know you know you just know something and that's good enough you know mm -hmm. okay all right jackie uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, add to this before we go. Um, I had had an experience here recently, and I, I too, I, I'm not drawn to the living letters. It's not anything I've studied or even paid attention to. But as I'm in this engagement, we're uh, engaging holiness before the throne. And all of a sudden, I saw living letters floating around the throne. Mm. And I thought, oh, mm -hmm. and I, I knew what it was. I thought, those are living letters. Uh, and I was like, oh, why, did, why did I see that? Uh, you know, it puzzled me because I, it's not anything that I'm looking for. Mm. And what you said has helped me to understand mm. that, uh, that it, it possibly could have been God's thoughts of you know, holiness of, yeah. you know. And we can definitely uh, get <laughs> to receive those thoughts, you know, so that actually was that a communication at a level beyond just language of his holiness you know and actually you know i've i had a, an encounter where god spoke to me about peace and he gave me a sort of a i don't know paragraph couple of paragraphs about peace and i read you know i heard it i wrote it down and it was like you know quite moving in peace I was at a conference and this guy, um, Carl Whitehead, I think his name is, he took the Hebrew letters of the word peace, shalom, and he explained what it means in the pictorial language of each letter, meaning a picture and a, and a concept of something. And therefore, then he read out what peace meant using the picture language and putting it all together into this sentence or couple of sentences. And it was pretty much identical to what God said to me directly. 
I didn't need to learn to understand what all those letters of Shalom meant to experience and have the revelation of what peace was. He spoke to me in English directly, pretty much word for word, expressing that concept. So, you know, if you want to learn Hebrew and, and understand that, that's great. But I think it's much easier just to let God speak to us and convey to us what he wants to convey. Because that then means you don't have to go through another language process to try and understand something that God is wanting us to, commun to communicate with us and to help us understand it. You know, and it, for me, it was like, OK, that's really interesting. And that guy knew that stuff because he'd learned the language. But I didn't have to learn the language and God spoke to me exactly the same. So I don't think God has to. You have to learn Hebrew at that level to understand the concept behind the word because i think that's what living letters do they convey the meaning behind the word to you so you can experience it but i don't think you have to see them for that to happen that might be just what they're doing when god is communicating to us and just like an angel doesn't really want us to focus on the angel but focus on the message because angels are usually messengers so the living letters wouldn't want us to be focusing on them as beings, but on what they're conveying to us so we can understand and experience. And they will do that in English or Spanish or whatever language happens to be the language that you think in first so that you can experience it. Um, and, you know, you, you get that knowledge of the heart, which is really what it's about. It's the knowledge of the heart that you experience and receive from God. And if living letters are involved in that, I think they don't really want to be seen most of the time. And you may have just, when you engage the throne room, been sort of seeing how God forms his thoughts and sends them out so that we can experience them. But for, for most people, it wouldn't be Oh, they see a living letter, then they've got to go and look it up and try and find out what it means. You just know it. You get it because that's what they're designed to do, I believe, convey the heart behind something to us so we experience and know it. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. We really appreciate you taking the time. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.